How many of you like to tell stories about your businesses? I show of hands. Good. How many of you are really good at it? Okay. How many of you want to get really good at it? Oh, right. And how many of you just showed up for the food? Okay, with the illusion that there would have been pizza, which there apparently isn't. Okay, well, sounds like we're all in the right place. What we're going to do is spend a very short amount of time highlighting effective storytelling. And I remember this group when it was the desktop publishing organization, because I go back that far. And if you're wondering about the stool, the... Uh, Warranty on my body expired two years ago, so every once in a while I need to uh, humor myself, so now I am. So, we're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at five ways you can tell effective and interesting stories. Now, i got to be frank with you. I don't know anything about digital publishing. My website was designed by pros. My newsletter and business card was designed by pros. The only thing they didn't do is design my attire, and you can obviously see the difference. So my biggest weakness tonight, and a reason you might be asking Spike, you know, why the hell did you invite this guy, is I don't know anything about what you do. But I'll tell you, the value I bring to you tonight is that I don't know anything about what you do, but I've been a customer. I hired whatever people called you guys in the 80s while at Progressive. I have hired and partnered with your colleagues since then. So I'm going to view it through the lens of a potential customer, because that's why we do all this stuff. We'll also talk about presentation anxiety, stage fright, the jitters, and it'll try to help you. You can't get rid of it. Well, you can, but the, the price is suicide. Uh, so what you have to do is manage it, and we'll talk about that. So sound like what you signed up for, besides the illusion of pizza? OK. If you want more content than we'll, we're able to do, I will pass around a print copy of my newsletter, comes out once a month. There's no marketing in it at all. It's all content. And every month I have at least one newsletter issue, I mean one content piece on presentation skills. So if that appeals to you, put your card in there. Um, if it doesn't, don't. And I think the system asks you, really, you want to sign up for this or you have to say yes? And if you don't have a card and you use somebody else's, cross that person's name off. Otherwise, they'll get two copies and you won't get any. Happens every time. Okay. Now, a few process details. If you were hoping for... A stimulating lecture, you're in big trouble. Because I don't do that. Not at all. And, and really, in your heart of hearts, you don't want that. This is going to be a conversation. Communicate, ask questions, have fun. I'll ask questions of you, and we'll get along really well. So let's get the show on the road and get ready to rock and roll through your showcases. I had the pleasure of looking at some of your showcases on YouTube. Uh, I watched four and then spent two hours looking at cute puppy videos. And uh, another half hour looking at the Subaru Golden Retriever commercial campaign. But I did watch four of your uh, samples. And my comments will be included in what I say tonight. So I am not going to otherwise offer a critique. I think that's rude. However, you may not like what I have to say. It may be different than these books. I've read some of these. I haven't written one yet. I got to wait until I would rather sit down than get up in front of people or sort of get up in front of people. But I have 
150 articles, all I have to do is cut and paste. Maybe I could hire one of you to help me with that. But everything we talk about here, there are very few rules. So this is all subjective. So I'm looking at it through a lens of 35 years of experience, working with big companies, small companies, doing consulting, training, and executive coaching. And that all drives the best practices I'm going to share with you. But again, there aren't rules. If we talk about something tonight that's different than what you do or different than what you'd think you do, fine. Just promise me one thing. Don't tell me it won't work until you tell me it didn't work. Because whatever I share has worked for a lot of people. So with that in mind, off we go. So next month is your showcase. Why do you have a showcase here? This is the part in the program where the professional speaker stops talking and audience jumps in. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, and uh, sure, okay, and it saves on the budget. Okay, that's a good reason. Why else do you do a showcase? To get to know other attorneys that are doing Why? Uh, because uh, to help us professionally, you know, to enhance our business and our, our work. Why? Why not? Okay, good answer, good answer. Now, that is the... That is the uh, three-year-old's approach or the, the interviewer approach, the five whys. You'll get down to it sooner or later. Uh, any other thoughts? Why do you do a showcase here with this group? My understanding is everybody in this room could be a competitor, but everybody in this room could be a referrer or a partner. So the showcase can tell each of you who, could, who you could refer for their uh, unique specialty or, who, you, or who, who could refer you or you get a piece of work bigger. M most of you are one and two person shops, right? Anybody bigger than two people? Okay, so you say, yeah, we can do that, and then you're scurry around trying to find somebody who can do that. I know that. I'm a one-person shop. So the value of the showcase is to let people know how you can help them, how you can solve a problem for them on a referral basis. For instance, I have a Macintosh. I'm going to be working with Spike because the initial person I talked to, also an alumni, uh, said, I don't do that, but I got a guy. So Spike's the guy. So referrals make the world go round. So the more people know about you, the easier it is to refer or to partner. So I guess that's why you do the showcase. Spike, any other reasons? Yeah, you know, I guess I can add something. I didn't want to speak up right away because I wanted to hear with other people. <coughs> oh, I that I've been around since the beginning. And uh, this is, I think, the 15th. Wow. You had said we've been doing it for a while. It originally started as a portfolio show when you had your portfolios and you carry them around with the handles and open them up to show your work. No one does that anymore. That's how we started. And people complained because they couldn't, they had to leave their own work table to go look at other people's mm -hmm. art. So when we, we adopted the five minute presentation at that point. And it is for you to get to know each other and a network for business, but because you are artists, you have visual products that you don't really get to see when you're sitting next to someone at a meeting. Exactly. You don't get to see Kim, Kim does video and they're awesome and so and so does logos and you don't really get to see what their, what their talents are. Exactly. So the showcase for your group is an end in itself, but it's a means to an end, and that's to practice skills in case you ever have to pitch in front of a client. Now, there'd be two kinds of showcases with client work, uh, and I'm sure you've been in on, on some or both. One is they're shopping. So they invite 10 providers, whatever they're shopping for, to come in and do a get acquainted thing. They want to narrow it down to three to figure out who they want to spend time with because they have to spend a lot of time telling those three people what they think they already know about what they think they need and what they think they can afford. They sure don't want to have that conversation with 10 people. That would make them crazy. So it's a show-off showcase. 
You don't know why they're calling you in necessarily other than we're shopping for a new X. And the showcase you do here is probably the closest to that. But what typically happens, and, and share your experiences to the contrary, please, uh, you're one of 10. Then you become one of three. You made the cut. You got callbacks. So now you go talk to them and do your due diligence and ask the 100 questions, 90 of which they never thought of. They go, oh, I never thought of that. And every time you hear a prospect go, hmm, I never thought of that, just pat yourself on the back for being as good as you are. Then you're going to come back and, and answer the question, how can I help you? How can we help you with this? Well, you're not going to do that in five minutes. They may give you an hour. They may give you a half hour to come in and make the pitch. And bear in mind that you're not walking out with the sale because there's two other people just like you. So that's my thought on the two different applications of this showcase, the practice and get acquainted with your colleagues here and you know, potentially getting comfortable with the concept for pitching business to clients. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anything else? Anybody want to add? Comments? Okay. Has anybody gotten business from their showcase or like work, referral work because you did a presentation at one of the, at one of the main meetings? I mean, did you get, Billy, did you get work from doing yours last month? No. Or last year? No. no. And it may be a year from now. And it may be never, so you got to go into it with that. I talked about a good camp for my demo, and we got volunteers. Cool, wonderful. Now, don't think of anybody in this room, and certainly don't answer my question with enough specific detail so we know who you're talking about, okay? Who's seen a showcase from hell? After about 30 seconds, you went, oh my God, this is going to suck so bad. Okay, you've, who's seen a, a showcase from hell here or elsewhere? Okay, what made it hell for you? Uh, the person stopped talking at ha about halfway through. And she, they um, didn't know where to go. No, uh, unfocused. The slides kept moving, and it was very disturbing. Ooh, that must have been painful for you. Painful for them, painful for you. Who else has seen one from hell? Yes, sir. Uh, and it's a video, and next thing you know, I saw five different cameras in two different like styles, and I didn't know where to begin. So it's ooh ooh, look what I could do, whiz bang, slap bam. Okay, some of you may go back enough time with desktop publishing, where you could create slideshows. On what was the earliest software? Yeah, I don't remember because I didn't learn how to use it. I had somebody by that point who could do that. You know, but you got all the bells and whistles and all that crap, and everybody got really excited. And go, Come on, see what I can do. Well, that <clears throat> lasted a very long time till they realized, ooh, don't do any of that. For instance, um, how many colors can PowerPoint palette create? You're all graphic people. You know this answer. How many colors? Well, put a number on unlimited. 2,200,000. You're absolutely right. Actually, it's 2,100,000, but I gave you credit. Partial credit. Now, the average adult in America, how many shades or hues can he or she perceive and differentiate? Less than 300. Can't even do the, do they still do the, what's the book with the chips? The Pantone. The Pantone, yeah. That's not, what is that called? What's the initial? Because I was going to say PMS, but I know that's not it. It is PMS? Oh, really? I wonder what names were on the list at Pantone that they didn't go with that they chose PMS. All right, anyway. It's, there's 780 in the uh, Panatone thing, right? Something like that. You, you can't perceive all of them. If they show you, well, here's 280 and 284, can't tell the difference. So that's just marketing hype and BS. So you want to get past that. Now, 
You've defined, anyone else, a description of a showcase from hell? The ones I've heard people like you describe are too long. Of course, you've got a tight time limit here. Rambling, unfocused, overkill, death by PowerPoint, all of these kind of things, whether there's a rigid time limit or automatic slide change or not. So if it isn't obvious, what would make a winning showcase? Describe the qualities of a winning showcase then. Simple, engaging, concise. Three good things. Sure. Anybody else add to the? Why don't you say effective and efficient? Yeah, effect. That's one of the mantras of the Goldman Sachs: effect, effective, efficient, compelling. Yeah, all those things. What else makes it really a winning pitch, a winning showcase? Yeah. The, the answer to the question, why are you telling me this, is abundantly clear. Now, audiences, your colleagues, clients, are bright enough that they can connect the dots. But that's making them work. Connect the dots for them. Do it in a way that doesn't sound particularly condescending, but don't make them figure it out. Help them. The reason I'm talking to you today is you know. So it's not really hard to do a winning pitch, a winning showcase because of the time and the slide limit that gives you a couple of parameters that you have to work within, and we'll get to that. So any other comments or questions at this juncture? What, what I tell people is you can tell a really good story in five minutes, and if it's a really bad story, it's only five minutes. That's right. Except you will hear me say, never tell a good story in five minutes, because at, after one minute they're going, where is he going with this? Anyway, okay. So the first part of the, of the real meat here is effective storytelling, and I want to encourage you to be effective with five different techniques. The first is a focused message, and you said it. The message ought to be clear, why am I saying this to you? What do I want you to do with this information when we're done? And it ought to be really clear. We call that audience centricity. Said another way is customer centricity. In the client pitch point of view, unless they're an existing client and you're going after new business, it's a prospect. A prospect becomes a client when the first check clears your bank. Then they cross over the bridge and they're a customer for life unless you screw it up. So prospect-centered, audience-centered, customer-centered. Everything you do is for them, not you. And that's the problem that some people get into with storytelling because, oh, I love telling stories, and I'm so good, and it's so much fun, and I really enjoy it. And nobody cares. Does the story have meaning and value for them? Are they going to get something out of hearing it? You know, why do we read stories to our kids? It's not because we want to know one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Even if we haven't memorized that, we don't need that information. We read it because they like it. And if they can't understand the words, they like the sounds and the tempo, and they're seeing colors. So when we read a story to a child, we're not reading it for us. We're reading it for them. The only exception is... If I am babysitting, and our kids are on both coasts, and they won't go to sleep, I have a copy of my master's thesis in both houses, and I start reading from it, and they'll first look at me with awe, and then that you know, kind of squirreled up face, and then they fall asleep. Or they pretend to, knowing that if I think they're asleep, I'll stop. So the whole thing is focus. Focus on why they're in the room because it ain't about you. And this is hard for people. This is really hard for people. Whether the they are your colleagues in a pug showcase, or potential customers, or you're at a chamber event and you do a 10-second you know, or 30-second version of that, it's all about who's listening, not who's talking. Questions? about the audience-centric focus? Can you give some examples of that? 
Like, or would, that, would, would someone say when they wanted to do that? Well, first of all, I would want to know what you want to know, or I would ask you. So I can work off your agenda. You helped me with that. We kind of put it together. But in my opening few questions, I kind of got a sense, you know, for where you're coming from. So it's not about me. It's about you. And here's information you've said you want or, in my experience, I know you need. So with, with, um, with the showcase here next month, why should you hire me? to be, or why should you refer business to me, or why should you bring me on as an ally or a partner? What value do I slash my company bring to you? And then answer that question. So it's not what I do, it's how what I do benefits you. It's the difference between features and benefits. Features don't sell anything, benefits do. The feature of my Ultima Coupe is that it is scarlet crimson. The benefit is it is such a cool color. People to this day look at it and go, wow, look at that old fart and that really cool car. That's a benefit. Now, it came because it's a very different color. And it was a stock color. I would never pay more than yeah. It was a stock color. In the shade, it looks purple sparkle. In the sunlight, it looks, wait, no, in the shade, it looks uh, black. In the sunlight, it looks purple, sparkle. So, you know, features and benefits. Features drive benefits. But if all you do is stop at features, you don't give anybody a reason to want to do anything with you. So that is the first piece. By the way, part of the uh, expired warranty is I got cataract surgery, and the guy gave me a, a deal. He said, you can see far and not up front, or up front and not far, you can't do both. And I opted for, I can read the mailbox on that house across the street, but I couldn't read your name tag without the, the Marks cheaters. So I bought them by the pound uh, at Marks, so thank you. All right. The second piece here is you be, ex uh, you be effective with audience-centered content, and I kind of segued into that. So the content's for them, not you. And when you're not sure, ask them, what would you like to know? Now, you wouldn't do that during the showcase because there's no time frame for that. But during a pitch, if somebody says, you know, we're, we're shopping for new graphic designers, we, we've heard about you, we'd love to have you come in and talk to us. You've got five minutes in front of the executive team. Has anybody ever been in a situation like that? Well, others like you have. It's not that totally unusual. So there's nothing to say, well, tell me about the company. Tell me about the group. What are you really looking for? They may not tell you because they, they don't want to give you an advantage or they don't know. It depends on who you're talking to. But it doesn't hurt to ask, what do you want? And then do the best you can to deliver that. Here's something that most people don't think of, but because I'm a wordaholic, I have to share this. Be careful of your pronouns. Your pronouns can be your worst enemies. If you're talking to potential clients, you can use second-person pronouns. You. You will benefit from the expertise we bring to the party you will have your work done on time, on plan, on budget. You can use that, by the way. On time, on plan, on budget, spin the, any way you want. But if you're talking about your business to someone, they aren't your customers. So you shouldn't use you, but third person, they. Because then you're talking about the value you bring to those customers. They're not the ones in the room. Now, with your showcase here, the people in the room could, in fact, be your target audience. So you want to be careful that the value my company brings to my clients and potentially some of you. See, you can combine it by a third person and second person in the same sentence. But we do pitches in the Goldman Sachs program, and one of the modules, they're pitching to bankers to get money. And you know, we make the point, 
They're not your customers. So don't say, we do a really good job of cutting your hair. It's we do a really good job of cutting our customers' hair. And, you know, most people don't think about that. So be the small minority who do and use your pronouns uh, appropriately. Any questions on pronouns? Okay. Let's see. Ah, now here's where we're going to clash. Because I believe stories are great. We are a storytelling culture. But in this context, short, focus to the point is better than long. So I would never say tell a five-minute story. All you're going to do is, A, somebody, if I was in that audience, turn me off. And if I were one of you, I would come away not knowing a whole lot about you unless the story was all about you. So think about that. Stories are nothing more than slightly longer examples. A story follows the phrase, for example, and then you tell a real short story. Now, um, Sandy, I remember you had one client where you indicated that you did a mailer for them, and it increased their results by 38%, and, and, and the, the net result was two million bucks or something outrageous. Okay that I even remembered that only hearing it once said that was really focused. Because what Sandy did is talk about, uh, to some very limited extent, problem, and then action and results, called PAR. Problem, what was the problem the client handed me? What was the action I took on their behalf? And what was the result? If you only talk about action, yeah, they can kind of connect the dots backward and forward, but again, they're not all going to make it easy for them. Now, you can only do that effectively with three or four examples. It's hard to do that with ten examples. So this gets to something very hard for you. So I'll say, what do you do? And you say, I do a lot of things. Well, what kind of subject matters do you concentrate in? Oh, I've done everything. Well, what kind of, if this sounds like you, I'm sorry. What kind of industry uh, segments do you specialize in? Well, I've done work for everybody. Now, that may be true, but what you've just said is if you're not something to somebody, you're nothing to nobody. So we all have stuff, a long list of stuff, but do an 80-20, a Pareto principle. Look at your last two years and your book of business. Where did most of it come from? Because the typical Pareto principle, those of you in math who remember the 17th century um, uh, Muslim uh, uh, mathematician, Pareto. No, he was Italian. The, the Muslim guy was uh, Akim with his razor, which is also good when two things are equal. The, sh the simple solution is always the better one. So look at it and say, while I do a lot of things, most of my work is in A, B, and C. That doesn't preclude you doing something else. Except I'll tell you, if I'm listening to you, I want somebody to do my project for whom that's one of their top things. I don't want to hire somebody who, yeah, I could. I did that once. So sell your value proposition. Sell your strengths. And the way we talk about it is, while I've done a lot of different content, the three areas I've done the most work in, or the three areas I'm the most passionate about, are A, B, and C. And while I've worked for a lot of different types of industries and clients, most of my work comes from A, B, and C. And again, that doesn't preclude you ever getting work that isn't on your A, B, and C list, but again, why would they hire you? And you wouldn't love it in the first place. In fact, in some cases, you were making that up. So then you'd have to run out and hire somebody to do that because you really didn't mean it. So go with your three best. Three is a good number. People can remember three or less. You know, go with two. But then that tends to be narrowing. So when you're talking about value proposition, really narrow it. Really limit it. So somebody can remember. And instead of, again, you may not uh, agree at all here, instead of going with 10 examples, go with the three very best ones.
because people will remember three, they won't remember ten, and your three best ones may get lost in the shuffle. Questions or comments? I would say for your slides, like you, you know, I have to be um, firm or what I No, right. Now that has firm, to fit you, into your context. You could actually do the same slide, two slides in a row or three. Like if you want to talk about something longer, you could, yeah, longer. you know, it could be the same image or slide or, and that gives you instead of 15 seconds, 30 seconds or 45. Yeah. Which would help with that idea. Exactly. Because, uh, you know, you're all visual communicators for the most part. Let your pictures do the talking. If you have to explain the picture, it's a bad picture. It ought to stand on its own feet. Or with the simplest, this mailer card, you know, had this kind of results. 38% response, $1.2 million in sales from this card because we coded it and we know. That's pretty impressive stuff. So, at this point now, let's say you've got some thoughts about crafting this really effective message with some very short focus stories in it. That's very much the left brain piece. Now you got to get up in front of a bunch of strangers, or in this case, some colleagues, and present it like, like Sandy did. So the last two things are be effective with dynamic and engaging vocal delivery. I like to break the delivery piece into two. First, the vocal. You got to be loud enough. Now, because I'm on a microphone means I may be loud enough for him because he's got a little knob back there, but I may not be loud enough for you because we're not one-on-one -on -one conversation distance. The two of you might be. Or actually, the two of you are about two feet apart, mouth to ear, if you were having a conversation. That's fine. And we, as humans, are programmed from birth to the inside voice thing. We really are. It's annoying as hell. But how many times have you heard, shh, no talking, shh, you're too loud, Shh, you'll wake the baby. Shh, no talking in the library. It doesn't take a lot of that feedback for you to program the monitor in your brain, and when the red light goes on, you go, I'm too loud. Well, I had mine surgically removed, so I don't even have a church whisper. And I embarrass my wife at every opportunity. I mean, I don't do it on purpose. It just happens. Like, we'll be someplace and I'll make a reference to a person, and I'll say, apparently they don't have mirrors in that guy's house. I wonder if he's a vampire. And I'll say it real soft, and yet not soft enough, you know. So, uh, but if you speak up louder, I'm not going to be too loud for you. And if I'm too loud for the mic, he'll turn the knob down. Here's what happens when you get louder. It slows you down. That's a good thing. It forces you to breathe more. That's a good thing. It calms you down. That's a good thing. And we, in our culture, equate volume with credibility and confidence. And the lack of volume with the opposite. So we are a loud talking culture. So who talks loud? Teachers? Parents, cops, they all talk loud, and it's a power thing. So if you're up here going, you know, you're not getting any power, and you want to have power, but not obnoxious power. So speak up. The second thing is to vary your pitch. If you're a monotone, oh, that usually comes up on the pitch from hell list. And over Vary your pitch. Inflection means pitch, not volume. So you can go up or down, and you can do that for a variety or emphasis. Pacing is another thing. Most people talk too fast. Now, the more you practice your presentation, the more you know it, and the more it becomes... We're good? Yeah. The more it becomes second nature, the more it, it, it works into your long-term memory. 
But remember, they've only heard it the time you're doing it. So if you slow down to a listener, audience-centric pace, it's easier for them to keep up with you. So the response of, I got two pounds of sand and a one-pound pail, I'm going to talk twice as fast, mm -hmm. is the antithesis of this, and it just screws it all up. So the pacing is important. Slow down. And then that is coupled with pausing. Pause more and longer at obvious points. The pause allows them to process. And the pause allows you to look at your notes without looking like an idiot. And remember what to say next without uh, breaking any eye contact. So to en enhance and harness the power of vocal delivery, louder, slower, pause more often, and pump it up. Questions about vocal delivery? And frankly, this works in most conversations one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, you want to tone it down because it's a different formality or lack of, but still, some, uh, some conversations that you have with people would benefit from some of this. Now, the last piece is adding effectiveness to what you're doing with powerful physical activity. We talked about the vocal piece. Now let's look at the physical activity. First is eye contact. What kinds of eye contact weird things have you seen people do? I'm getting my, my eyes. Okay. Close your eyes when they're talking. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Why do they do that? They are concentrating, and all of this visual information interferes with my ability to concentrate. That's absolutely right. That's why people look up in their head. They look up to the ceiling because the ceiling is usually white. I was talking about that in a group in a hotel room, training room, and I said, looking up at the ceiling, well, it was a mirrored ballroom, and when I looked up at the ceiling, I saw some idiot looking down that happened to be me. <laughs> but yeah, um, closing eyes doesn't work. What else doesn't work? And, and believe me, they can tell. Even with my bad eye, you can tell where I'm really looking. And if you think I'm looking at your ear, what are you asking yourself? Yeah, and why aren't I looking you in the eye like a normal person? Okay, what else do you see people do that's kind of lame with eye contact? How about scanning the room? They said make eye contact with everyone. All right, I'm doing that. I'm scanning the room, except... I'm like a sprinkler, and I'm, I'm scanning, so I'm not landing on anybody. So I'm avoiding engaging. It's in one of these books, I'm sure. Find a spot 10 feet high on the wall and look at that. So that would probably be the top of the camera. So I'm going to look at the top of the camera, which means I'm going to avoid looking at any of you, and you can all tell. So a lot of this stuff is just lame and stupid. The best thing is to look at somebody. You know, eight or ten seconds, complete a thought. Then find somebody else and do it in silence. Now I'm looking over her at, here, at her, but she's not looking back. I don't care. I'm not going, hmm, she's down at her phone. I wonder if it's something I said or maybe I confused her or she's just, yeah, the hell with it. You know, if I can't look at her eyes, I'm going to look at her scalp. You know, I don't know what she's doing, and I don't care. And it doesn't matter, but I'm not going to have it throw me off. I didn't mean to embarrass you if oh, that was fine. ruder. But. <laughs> so you, you work the whole room, but you don't do it in order. It's like when the nuns used to take attendance in class, you knew you had at least three minutes to screw off before they got down to the W's. Okay. Don't be predictable. And whenever you are moving to change faces, do it in silence. So that's where the pause thing can come in. You pause, you take a breath, look at your notes, you look up and start talking. Yes, sir? One of the interesting things about these presentations and a lot of presentations I do is there's a 
show on yeah. time. How do you handle that when you're looking at people? Do you how do I handle it, or how would you handle how, it? How should somebody handle that? If you got to have the slides, you're competing with the slides. So where do you want them to engage, the pictures or you? They're not going to do both. So if you need the pictures, you've got to plan your message to support what they're seeing on the screen. In my case, have you know, how many of you have noticed I'm not doing PowerPoint? OK, thank you. How many of you mind? You want your money back, because that, that guy's not doing any goddamn PowerPoints, right? OK. <laughs> I can tell you that we've had presentations where there were pages that were blank. Yeah. And that was a purpose. Sure. Because the speaker wanted to talk about something where it didn't. All right, here's the trick. If you've got a background, like a pattern, the slide in between relevant content is just a pattern. Or, depending on how your laptop or keyboard is configured, try hitting B. Who knows about letter B? And this isn't the Sesame Street song, letter B. All right, depending on how this thing is configured, hit letter B and the screen goes black. The projector's on, it's just not projecting. It doesn't turn off, because if you turned it off, because you had two minutes without a slide, it might not come back on, or it might take two minutes to power back up. Letter B is, is black, or nothing, in letter W, the screen goes white. So if you need, and, but black's less obtrusive on the eyes than white. So if you're not constrained to 20 slides in five minutes, and you get to what you got a content point, you're supporting with a slide, and this content point you're supporting with a slide, you don't have one or need one in here, lose the slides. Because the longer you leave up a slide that's done, the more distracting it becomes, and the dumber you look. You're going, doesn't he know he's done with that slide yet? And the sooner you bring up a slide before it's ready, the more of a distraction it is, because now they're reading chapter five, and you're still doing chapter four. So the answer is, figure out a way not to have a visual if you have that control, if you have that power. Uh, my thinking is less is more. So many people in the business world, in corporate and organizational America, have been victim of death by PowerPoint, that here's what happens. There's going to be a meeting tonight. You walk in the room, you see the slide on, and you go, uh-oh, this is really going to suck again. Death by PowerPoint. And the whole time, before it starts, you're thinking, oh, man, I hope this isn't this pain. And you're working yourself into an anxiety attack. It takes you five minutes to realize, you know, that guy's slides aren't too bad. They don't suck like everybody else's has. But that's a conscious thought process that has to override your, oh, no, slide. So here's two tricks. Don't have the slides on until you're ready for them. Chuck them out. Make sure they work. And then figure out a way, like letter B, to douse them so there's nothing on the screen. Then there's nothing for them to be distracted. They won't know how bad your slide is if they can't see it. And the other thing is, and again, not in your context, I realize that, and because you're visual communicators, you gotta have, you got to have graphic representation of your work. But in my work, I go in and I don't have slides. And it's conspicuous but it's conspicuous generally in a good way. And, and I've gotten more comments. Now, somebody may be sitting in the third row thinking, what's that moron, no slides? What the hell, doesn't he not? All I know is what I see in here. And if I don't see and hear that, I'm going to assume, okay, it's working. So give some thought to that. In the real world, don't let the slide tail wag the content dog. And I'll move off this before you start throwing something. Okay, uh, next piece is stance. All right, so I got it. Ah. Okay, stand still and don't move unless you have a reason. Now that may sound rather restrictive. If you're behind the podium, God help you because three-fourths of your body's hidden. 
And for some of you that are heist challenged, all we see is like a talking head. It's like driving on the interstate and all you see is, you know, a white head and you want to go, haven't you moved to Florida yet? You know, you want to say that. But if you're not, stand still unless you have a, a reason to move. Now, there are reasons to move, but swaying back and forth ain't one of them. This, as comforting as it may be, ain't one of them. And let's see, shifting weight, even, you know, you want to do a plie, save it for dance class. So what I uh, encourage my clients to do is stand still. That's powerful. I'll tell you, when the general is addressing the troops, he's not swaying back and forth or rocking back and forth. He's standing there. So that's a power stance. And only move when you have to. And if you have to be back here, fine. But can you control your laptop from here and not have the box block you? By the way, uh, I ranted about this again in my last issue, and one of my quasi-friends who's a, within 20 seconds, he's back to me uh, with typos. He said, Phil, this is a lectern. The stand that it's on is a podium. And I said, I lied. And I said, I know that. But most people would call this thing the podium, so I'm going with conventional conversational language. So if you got to use this thing, don't let it be a shield. Don't let it be a, a factor that blocks you off from them. You can do everything you need to do in, unless you need to operate all those things. And then when you do, go over there and come back. And that two seconds is motivated. It's natural. You take a breath drink some water, look at your notes, all of that stuff while you're moving. Okay. For those of you who have a, a MacBook and an iPhone, there's a couple free apps that I've yeah. used before. Uh, I don't know if they're still active, but I've used a lot of a touch mouse and remote pad where you can, so you can just have your phone and just, just click it without. Sure, or just get a remote. Now these guys will attest I don't use, first of all, I don't use very many slides, don't tell. Goldman Sachs then. Uh, I don't use very many. None of us actually do a lot of slides, but um, we have remotes, and I don't use it because I get so involved that I've gestured in the remotes. So I figured I can't break it or, or, or hit somebody in the face with it if I don't use it. So I don't use a remote, but you know, you certainly can, and then you're not strapped to the machine. Now, uh, look comfortable, but in control. Now, the next thing is gestures. I can do this seated. Your hands are your best visual aids, and most of you have two functional ones. That's great. Use them appropriately, but don't... If you never gestured, what would you look like? Well, first of all, somebody who wasn't Italian, but besides that, how would you... You'd look weird. Or you'd look like the guy from Riverdance and he's on stage by himself and he's got nobody you know, to dance with. So, yes, gesture. That is human nature. We all gesture. Just watch people in conversation without looking like you're stalking. They, they gesture with each other. But don't do it all the time and don't do the same thing all the time. So when I tell people, when you're presenting and you're fully exposed to the audience, stand with your hands down. So when you do move, there's motion, it, it, it attracts uh, the eyes of the audience, and keep your gestures up here so that they're regularly looking at your face. If you're gesturing down here, that's where they're looking. And if you're standing like this, that's where they're looking. And is that where we want them to look? I don't think so. So keep your hands to your side and sort of a, just a loose thing. Adjust your two hands, one hand. People say, I like to put my hand in my pocket. Okay, I do that occasionally if I'm not wearing tight cut pants, um, which I am tonight. Uh, the way to look like you're losing weight is to buy pants two sizes larger. That's why I look so good. So 
Yeah, it's okay to put your hand in your pocket, but don't keep it in there because you lose the power. And if you got the shakes because of the adrenaline going through your system, you know, when you know you're doing this and you put your hand in there to hide it, you know, you're still shaking. It's just everybody can see it and they see your pants moving and they wonder what the hell's in his pocket. Did he bring his pet gerbil with him? You know. So all of these things distract the audience. And the last thing you want to do is distract them. You want to engage them. Last point is, uh, oh, fidgety gestures. Okay, what's wrong with this? You've seen this one. Some of you may even do that. What's wrong with this? How long before somebody in the audience starts to sing, it's a bit spider. <laughs> Don't put your hands together. There's too much danger there, really. You put your hands together like this, and oh, that does feel good. Really need to get some lotion when I get home. Boy, Whew. I'm feeling good. And it just it looks like it. And the eyes are drawn to hands that don't look confident or credible. Don't put your hands together. And if we're talking about three things, you don't need to be that obtuse. They get three. And plus, when do you put your fingers up? Tonight we're going to talk about before, three, during. Tonight we're going to talk about three, or after. Tonight we're going to talk about three. In all three cases, it's lame. You don't need to be that uh, obtuse with an audience. So, questions or comments about delivery, physical, vocal, or creating really engaging messages? Yes, sir. How did you become so good at your, I mean, you've got 35 years, is that right? Yes, sir. And I think you have given us a very, how did you get so good at doing Well, thank you. First of all, you're assuming I'm good at all, and I appreciate well, I that. I think you are. And I you get that on the video there, Bob? Um, thank you. Um, it's in my DNA. It's in my wiring, and I've been doing this a long time. Now. Marty and I go back to 1978 when I taught TV production at Normandy High School and he was in my class. And I was doing this stuff then. Now, it's different content, you know, but different audience, you know, but I was doing this stuff then. It's just practice. But who fell victim to the myth, the music teacher myth, that practice makes perfect? Who fell victim to that myth? Why is it a myth? It's not true. Yeah, yeah. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. If you want to be perfect, and you shouldn't be because only Allah is perfect, if you want to try to be perfect, you got to practice in a perfect way. So practicing a presentation isn't looking at your outline. Practicing a pre any more than practicing your drum solo is thinking about it or practicing the big. You think LeBron just watches video of himself making game winning shots? No, he's out there shooting a couple of hundred. So you have to continually practice at it, but you got to practice in the right way. Otherwise, you get permanently crappy. And people are like that. I've been doing it this way for 30 years. I know, and your big boss wants me to help you not do that. You know. Because he said your last pitch to the board sucked and he won't let you in that room again until I fix you. Now, do we understand each other? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a fun question, not that I really need to know, but how have you handled people that are talking loud during your presentation? Um, okay. They paid the same admission price as the people who are polite. I tend to tolerate it to a point, and then you know I'll stop and try to you know regain some control. But I, I don't want to totally piss them off, even though, oh, I so could. I've got like 12 lines just ready. But you know, we try to be a little you know more gentle than that, because I don't know why they're talking. And the conversation they're having 
may be a whole lot more interesting than the conversation they're having with me because when they listen, pardon me, when they listen, they're talking to themselves. So I don't know that. Just like somebody's dozing off, I let them. You know, they, pay, they bought a ticket. They can sleep all the way to, you know, uh, 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 Chicago on my flight. I don't care. Um, but, you know, that doesn't happen too often because normally we've got round tables and I'm working the room. And if I see somebody over in the corner, I will kind of work a little closer to them. I did that to you guys when you... But you guys were perfect students, of course. Um, or I just start raising my voice, or I'll look at them and be quiet. You know, simple little things. But I try really hard not to embarrass people because I in inadvertently embarrass people so much all the time that when I can think about not doing it, I will. Any other comments? Yes, sir. So I do a lot of presentations, so I have. Good for you. Um, I deal a lot with like visuals up on the slide. Now, typically when I do movement, like walking around, I'll try to actually stand center and then start off the presentation. And then I don't want to be in the way of my slides. So exactly. I move off to the side and then talk the rest of the way. Sure. What's your comment on Why that? Why do you move around? I mean, like instead of just... Yeah. Well, Why well, wouldn't you stand there the whole time? Because I'm thinking that it, it, it's better to start off in the center because you're gaining everyone's okay. attention that way. And then I move off to the side, that way they can focus. And then turn your first slide on, because if you're standing in the center and the slide is on, invisible to the speaker, but clear to the audience, lights go on over your head saying, dumbass. So if you're standing in front of the projected image. So first of all, don't do that. And you know, when I've asked people, why do you move around? Well, for variety. OK, if that's the best you can do to inject variety in your presentation, keep working at it. Because you, look, you can look like the caged tiger. And if somebody sees you walking back and forth, sooner or later they're going to say to themselves or the guy next to him, what the hell's he walking around so much for? Because they see no purpose. So my suggestion is stand still unless you've got a reason to move. And if you're going to move, engage the audience rather than going back and forth. So if I wanted to talk more to you, I'd come in, get into your space and talk. But then I'd go back. Now, if these were round tables and I went to the back, the tables in front have two choices. Not look and just hear me like I'm on the radio or turn around and look at my backside. Now, the front ain't all that great, but I hope most of you think the front view is better than the back view. So have a purpose for your movement. And ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it to work off nervous energy? or to give them a moving target which is harder to hit, and that's what they'll think. So I'm going to turn my back on you and go back and pretend I'm standing instead of sitting. I'm back in my spot. But I don't use slides. So my spot's the middle of the audience. If I was using slides, I'd be over there out of range of everyone. How much time do we Can have? Can just say one thing about Please. Chris, uh, who gave a presentation two meetings ago about HDR. And I think compared to the little criticism of the slides that move too quickly, Spike, you brought up that maybe they shouldn't. Because I'm watching the slides and I never did see the postcard. But back to Chris, he did one on high definition photography. Ooh, I would have liked to have seen which, it. Which, yeah, had, and he also spoke for an hour at least I would not have liked to have seen <laughs> Well, it was, it, it was a long, and it was a, a, took to all people at different levels and what you could do. Wow. But I, what I liked about it is he, he's, the slides weren't distracting from the presentation. They were kind of, yours is good because you don't have slides. You know, yeah. We're not looking at anything. But you, you have no place to look but here or right. at your so phones. Or so you're perfect by, you're not doing this five minutes. But what Chris did was he described his talk was about the slides. So it was an education. Well, of course, that's a whole different deal. So yeah. that's, and I don't think you moved around too much. I mean, 
if I did, I'd give another one. Yeah, I, I don't think it just, I don't want to leave with it yeah. and it distract what Chris did on that presentation. Uh, good for you, Chris. But, for, but, I, but my other suggestion like for the five minutes is if there's too much on the slides, but this is not a criticism, but I'm watching your slides and then I'm kind of trying to listen to what you're saying in, in it's happened in other showcases. Sure. I, I mean, I'm a retired accountant, so I'm going to let you know, and I'm a customer. God bless you. And there were no numbers in your slides. <laughs> and, so you were I, born I, from the get-go. And I wish I could speak as well as you do. Thank I you. mean, I, I have the confidence that you do. But, but I think the idea, if people are going to do the slides, to let it stay on longer and then talk about the slide, and not move them through too quick, Spike. Anyway, and, and that's a conversation we should continue right, offline. Thank you. thank you very much. Now, how much time do we have? Make up a number. About 8 o'clock, 10 more minutes. Fine, okay, let's briefly talk about presentation anxiety. And the reason I say briefly is, it's hard to do much in a short amount of time. So I, if I asked each of you who has pre, good seeing you, pal. Thanks for the memory trip, it was great. <laughs> He recognized me after 30-some years. God, that's scary. Um, OK, here's, here it is in a nutshell. You all have presentation anxiety, no matter who you are. It's part of your physiology. It's part of your DNA. And it is a typical physical response to a psychological stressor. Something causes you to be scared or to have fear and that's how your body responds. You get the adrenaline in there to fight or flight or freeze, and you can't do any of those. So you got all this adrenaline going through your body, and it just screws you up big time. Cotton mouth, the shakes, the flushes, brain farts, absolutely. It, the adrenaline messes up your internal time horizon. You've heard stories about the guy in the accident on the highway, and as he saw the the truck coming at him, he could see his whole life go by in front of him. Must have been a fairly short life. Uh, but that's true because it messes up your time horizon. So you can't do much about that unless <laughs> you medicate. Seriously. Some of my clients uh, take beta blockers. I do, but I need it you know, for other reasons. So in six minutes, here's how you manage or begin the process of uh, presentation anxiety and go to my website and I've got several articles on it. First, accept that it's a real thing and it's not you, it's everybody and it's normal and if you didn't have it, you would be uh, a corpse. Second, then, ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Why do I have fear? What causes me stress in a presentation or a public speech? and get as narrow and specific as you can. You might make a list of 10 things and accept the fact that these things vary by circumstance. Some of my clients are great presenting in front of peers. You get the big dog in the back of the room and you know they choke up. So circumstances can affect, content can affect your individual level. Now, I want to get a very quick discussion of what people are afraid of. I am not asking you what you are afraid of. That's rude, and I don't do that. What do people fear in general about speaking? What are they afraid of? Because it is the fear of blank. Fill in the blank with me. What do we got? Making a mistake. Making a mistake. Screwing up. OK. Offending. You know, oh my god, did I say that? Uh, yeah, offending somebody. Okay, whoa. Not connecting with somebody. Being totally unconnected. All right, what else are they afraid of? Just looking like an imposter. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing here. Why did they send him, you know? What else? Speaking in front of a lot of people. But, but why? What, what does that cause fear of? Uh, fear of embarrassment. Yeah, being embarrassed. Other answers we get is, I don't like how I look. I'm too tall, too short, too fat, too thin. My hair's too long, too short, too much, not enough. Whatever it is, we have terrible self-images. 
And therefore, we don't like people seeing us in that context. Now, people who are narcissistic don't have that problem. People fear looking stupid in front of the boss. People fear answer, being asked questions they can't answer. People fear forgetting. Okay, all that stuff. What you need to do in the privacy of your own home is make your list. Because all of that may not be your list. Some of that may not be your list at all. You may think you look great. you know. And don't I look good for 85? So you make your list. Then you do two things. With each of those things, and it's got to be real specific. Is there anything you can do about it? And sometimes the answer is no. But most of the time the answer is yes. So, I'm afraid I'll forget. What do you do? Practice and have decent notes. Duh! The people who wing it are the ones who have the greatest anxiety attack because they, they don't know where they're going. They can't say we're going to talk about three things because they haven't figured out how many they're going to talk about. So for each of these causes, attach a what I'll call minimizing activity. It won't get rid of it, but it's something conscious you can do. Uh, what if the big dog's in there? What do you do about it? Uh, no, that would, I, I wouldn't. He bought a ticket at Southwest Airlines just like everybody else. Or I'd seek him out up front and say, Charlie, we're going to do this uh, talk tomorrow to the team about X. Uh, do you have any questions, any points you want me to be sure I cover? So you reach out to the guy out of context to neutralize that. One of my clients, her CFO is an accountant, and he starts doing the let's get into the weeds, down into the so soil, down to the permafrost, and somehow we'll get down to, the, to China. You know. And she can't handle that. So the strategy is seek the guy out two days before, tell him what your agenda is, and answer all of his questions up front so he doesn't dominate and cause everybody else to go, you know. The. So for each of these things, if you don't like how you look, deal with it. Deal with it. They're not there for you. You're there for them. And they're not, you're not there for their looks, you know, you're there to share content they want or need. So get past the, I don't like how I look, you know. Does this podium make my butt look too big? You know, forget about that. That was something that you put in your head will get it the hell out of your head. So for each of these things, say, what can I do to reduce that level a little? Practice more. Make sure I'm reaching out to my audience with engaging comments and make sure it's audience-centric uh, uh, content, all that stuff. Now, there's still going to be a level of symptom left. Then, the third piece is to mask. Fake it. Fake it till you make it. So, fake it. Don't let them see you sweat. And if you do sweat, when you raise your hand, never raise it all the way up, okay? Never let them see you sweat. Don't do or say things that project nervousness. Oh, I'm so nervous. I don't know how, to, I don't do this. I haven't, don't say anything. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. It's their job to shoot you in the foot. So don't say anything to erode what credibility and confidence you may have. And you may even say things to add to it. I'm really looking forward to talking with you tonight. No, I'm not. I hate you and I hate this. They made me do it. That's the truth. So lie a little. It's okay. <coughs> and then physically, don't do anything like the nervous fidgets or anything like that, or talking too fast or talking too slow, to suggest lack of confidence. And do the things we talked about, those best practices really project a credible, confident image. So that's how you deal with it. Yes, sir. Can I give a possible story? Please, please. This is what I live by. And I used to be shy hard to believe. Um, 
I'm part of actually Toastmasters. Oh, good. And They're I'm wonderful. I'm in three clubs. Wow. And, um, yeah. I won't count your arms. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons why I want to find it, because, you know, I have a hard time talking to people, but, you know, that club boosted my confidence. Yeah. And Actually, that was a question I didn't get to answer. I wanted to get your input about Toastmasters. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. There is a club probably within 20 miles of where you live or work. Some are morning, some are lunch, some are afternoon, I mean, like, after work-ish. Some may even be Saturday. And it's intended to help people like you be more comfortable. Now, you got to, I mean, the concept's kind of old, and you kind of got to do the dance. And I've been in and out of Toastmasters, but nothing will help you more than getting structured feedback, <laughs> constructive feedback from people you frankly don't care about. So if you look like an idiot in front of your Toastmaster group, unless they're all part of your uh, in-house employee group, and that's not going to be the case with you, you can look stupid in front of them, and all they'll do is help you get past it. Greatest invention, very inexpensive, right? 100 bucks a year, something like that. Very reasonable. So I really recommend it. Sam? How come three different Toastmaster groups? Just to vary it up, or...? Um, just to push myself because, you know, I'm trying to, like, know that. see what I can do and push the limits in my okay. So I'm and still which, learning. which ones? Uh, I'm part of two Solon clubs and then one in Pittsburgh. Okay. You can visit for free if you're interested at all. Contact them through the, you know, Google Toastmaster and say, I heard good things. I'm interested. May I come and watch? And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't engage with them till I saw them. Maybe twice, you know, because, yeah, you're expected, you know, to play roles. And you can't just sit in the background and watch. I mean, if you're a member. So uh, it's, it's really wonderful. I've seen so many people really benefit from it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, something else? I, I forgot these. <laughs> And this was the feedback of part of our conversation. Oh, yes. And so I have forms for our two speakers for you to complete. And when Phil mentioned it, it was like, duh, like, why haven't we been doing this for a bunch of years? Because the idea is to help you improve your presenting as well as tell your story and network. But without feedback, you really can't improve other than the casual conversations that you have. So I have, I hope that you'll fill out these two forms before you leave. They're not very lengthy, Phil gave me some suggestions for those. I'm going to pass those out now. I'm going to ask you a question so you can answer that if you want. To have All right. Okay. So what's the best way to point? Like, I usually point by going like this because it's like it's less rude than using the finger. But, okay. And I read a book just recently about the Magic Kingdom from a woman that worked there. And she says that the way they point at Disney World is to use two fingers, which yeah. is funny to me. But that's what well, they, they only have three. Yeah, the characters only, only have three, right? The that's the Homer video. That's the Homer Simpson yeah. thing. All right. Whenever you do this, there's a negative reaction to the body language, no matter why you're pointing. So do it with an open hand. It's the same thing. You're pointing at someone or something. You don't need the gun look. You don't need the scold look. Just do it with an open hand. And ask yourself, do I need to point? There's three items on the screen, let's pretend. Do I need to point you to the third one when I say an item number three? You know, probably not. It's OK, but ask yourself, how do I point? Now, a 30 second on the concept here with these sheets. It's called plus delta. It's a concept for feedback that's been around 100 years at least, maybe, maybe 50. I'm not sure if Toastmasters uses it, but most feedback you get from people is generic, and uh, you learn more from your mistakes, so we focus on how you screwed up. That's the typical feedback that you got starting when you were two all the way through your master's defense, right? That's what they do. The plus delta concept is a little more holistic. It said pluses. These are things that worked, very specific things that you did that worked for me. And if you have the time, here's why they worked. Your volume was loud and clear. It made it easy for me to pay attention. 
especially during your intro. That's a plus. Implicit in that is keep doing that. Maybe do even more. And the opposite is not a negative. See, that's where people think you're going. The opposite is not a negative. The opposite is a delta, which is a Greek symbol of change. So when you say, and you'll be more successful if you make these changes, do more of something or at all, or do less of something or at all. So, and you'll be more effective if you pause longer in between sentences. So that's so that I can catch up with you. So that's specific, observable, and a plus delta kind of concept. But to say, oh, you did a really good job, pretty useless, because you don't know why. So that's plus delta. When's the best time to pass it out? Like, obviously, this isn't ideal. I mean, for you, I guess, maybe because it's, it's over, like, for Sandra, it'd probably be better right now. Uh, up front, yeah, all right. And what about, like, at the showcase? Because I'll do... Um, Usually I try to do six, six, and then an intermission, and then like seven. Or okay. Six. If you have uh, sheets for everybody in the room minus one, because you're not going to do one for yourself, and just put your name so somebody can ask for details, and if there's any reason why you're not comfortable owning up to what you say, then shut up uh, and put their name. So, you know, if there's 12 showcases, you'd want 11 sheets per person. So it gets kind of tedious. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the end of our trip. How many of you got some value from our time together? Oh, wonderful. That makes me feel good. So here's what we do next. First of all, the stuff you found of interest, do something with it. Otherwise, it's been a waste of our time. If you take away two or three things, try them. You know, make them work for you. If you signed up for my newsletter, it will uh, when I add you tomorrow, it will automatically ask you to validate it so there's no spam and no junk. Then start reading it. You can go to my site and um, look at specific uh, areas, content, if you have a particular interest. I've written like six things on presentation anxiety. Look at them. Print them, download them, whatever works for you. Uh, it's on the business card, which is here. Okay. Or, okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. help yourself. See, I didn't give you my card. You asked for it, and you're going to take it. That's a whole different conversation. And ask yourself, how important is it to me personally, me being you, how important is it to me personally to get better at this stuff? And how important is it to me professionally? Do a WIIFM. What's in it for me if I get better? And if there's a lot, then that ought to be your motivation to you know, work at it. And spend you know, time creating and time practicing your pitches and your presentations and the things you do at a chamber thing or whatever. So at this point, I wish you luck and blow the doors off next week or next month. <laughs>